Welcome to the Mintcast, an interview series featuring dissenting voices the establishment would rather you didn't hear. I'm Mint Press News senior staff writer Alan McLeod, and I'll be your host today. As an independent media watchdog outlet that exposes the corruption of the ruling class, we are constantly being hit by algorithms and other forms of soft censorship. So if you could in any way help uh, out by donating or even just liking and sharing this segment, that would be immensely helpful. The subject of today's interview is the United Kingdom. Now, Great Britain often gets something of a free pass in our media. It's presented as this old tiny place and generally a force for good. But our guest today has spent his life working sh to shatter that myth and exposing really what Britain's real role in the world is as an imperialist power. Mark Curtis is a distinguished historian and an author of several seminal books and is also the co-founder and editor of investigative journalism website, The Classified UK. Welcome to the show, Mark. It's very good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Well, it's very good to have you. So where to begin? I guess a lot of people around the world have quite a stereotypical and frankly incorrect view of Britain as this sort of neutral island that gave up its empire and is now no longer a real power and doesn't really do anything in the world. But that's really not the case, is it? And your work has been central in exposing that. So I guess what I'll ask you first is what is Britain's real role in the world? Well, I think if you, if you look at the, the declassified files of uh, the government planning record and then look at the actual historical record of British policy, it becomes quite clear how elites in Britain have viewed their, their role in the world. There's, t there's two primary goals that they have had over the decades. What, one is to ensure that the world economy functions in the interest of Western and British corporations, mul multinational corporations, to ensure that those companies, oil companies, banking companies, trading companies, um, have access to the world's resources to, to use for their purposes so that Western multinationals profit from other countries' resources. And in, in order to secure those objectives, Britain, often not acting alone, sometimes with the US, has done all sorts of things like trying to overthrow governments, um, trying to ensure that um, governments overseas do not primarily promote policies in the interests of their populations, but, but promote policies in the interests of the needs of Western multinational companies. And th this is a goal that comes through clearly in the, in the historical and uh, file record. The, the other goal, if, I mean, if that is the, was, is the economic goal that British elites have had, the, the, the political goal is to maintain Britain's great power status. The, Brit the British for you know, 200 years ruled the world. And at the end of the Second World War, Whitehall did not want to say, OK, well, now we're a second class power and we just have to put up with it. Um, the, the culture of uh, ruling the world is deeply embedded within um, British establishment. Uh, and in the late 1940s, there was a debate in Whitehall as, as to what Britain's post-war post role would be in the world. There was some entertainment given to what planners called a third force, which is where the UK would work with its colonies in Africa and Asia and try and act as some kind of third force between the, the, the US and the USSR. But it soon became clear that Britain was greatly weakened by the Second World War and couldn't sustain that kind of third force role. So what British planners did is they opted for a special relationship with the United States. This is about 1948, 1949 very clearly articulated. The British wanted to be the junior partner of the US in, a, in, an, in an orbit of American global power, as they, as they put it. Um, and ma maintaining that world role has been absolutely integral to British planners ever since. It's basically why Britain has nuclear weapons to, to, um, to, uh, to, so that British, the British can, uh, be, continue to be seen as an important and major military player in the eyes of the, the United States. Uh, one of the reasons why Britain acquired nuclear weapons in the 1940s was to uphold British power in the eyes of the, of the US. Um, and throughout 
throughout the post-war period, we, we see that Britain has done, you know, all sorts of things to, to uh, get rid of this notion that, that Britain has sort of slid into this second power, tertiary power status. What, what we see now with sending of these warships to the, to, to the Indo-Pacific region is, is another uh, example, if you like, of how British planners still want to, still want to project this idea that Britain is a global power. And to an extent, Britain is a global power, but just not in a, in a, in a very benign way. I mean, Britain is a global power when it comes to the, the, the reach of its multinationals. It's a global power in, in that it's, it's still a permanent member of the UN Security Council. It's one of the few countries that has nuclear weapons. It goes to war pretty much, you know, very regularly. It, it believes it continues to rule the world by force in alliance with the US. So basically, the, these two goals have, have been the leading ones, as, as seen by Whitehall planners, the, an, an e a global economic goal and a global military goal. And I think that's, you know, that, that is what, that's what's motivated British planners over the decades. I mean, of course, for the, for the, uh, for, for the audiences, for the media, for, for journalists and academics, Brit Britain's uh, officials and ministers like to claim that their world role is actually about promoting peace, democracy, and human rights all over the world. I mean, that's purely for the cameras. I mean, there's there's almost no mentions of those grand principles in the in the in the declassified government record. Um, you know, th those are simply not major concerns. The the real concerns are the hard economic and and political interests. Yeah, I guess a lot of people, politicians and journalists in the UK talk a great deal about the UK's special relationship, supposedly, with the United States. But uh, yeah, they talk about Britain, as you said, as being a kind of junior partner in this, uh, in this role. But across the other side of the Atlantic, it's not entirely clear whether this special relationship really exists. I mean, if you were to ask American politicians or pundits what a uh, country they do have a particularly close bond with, they might say Saudi Arabia or Israel. So I guess, uh, what, how would you describe Britain's role with the US more generally? I mean, I think there is a special relationship, but it's not the special relationship that mainstream journalists and academics pretend it is, because when they speak of a special relationship, they speak of some kind of benign relationship where the two are promoting peace, democracy, and human rights all you know, around the world. That's literally how some people think of, of the special relationship. Um, but really, the, 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 the high point, in my view, of the special relationship is where the UK plays the role of a junior partner to the US and supports uh, US aggression around the world. You know, whether, whether, it's, whether it's been in Iraq, or you know, in the in the two thousands, or whether in, in in Vietnam in the nineteen sixties, or whether in their various joint covert operations uh, throughout the the post war period, you know, Britain plays a supportive role to the U.S. Whether whether in military operations or or in intelligence operations, um, you know, we can we can go back to the to an, an episode that many people are familiar with, the, the joint Anglo-American coup to overthrow the Mossadegh government in, in Iran in 1953. I mean, that was a, you know, a British proposed operation, proposed by MI6, carried through by the, the CIA. That, that was just one example. In, in, in fact, it's interesting that in, in the same year, 1953, early, earlier that year, Britain had actually overthrown uh, another government, uh, the government in British Guyana, in, in, um, in, in South America. Um, uh, the first overthrow, actually, of a, uh, of a, of a post-war government in, uh, in Latin America. You know, we think of Latin America as US turf, where the US just gets rid of governments whenever it wants. It was actually Britain that conducted the first overthrow of the Chedi Jagan government uh, in British Guyana in 1953, actually for very similar reasons for, for why they overthrew Mossadegh in, in Iran. The, the Jagan government was keen to ensure that the country's major economic resources, which were um, sugar, sugar resources and bauxite resources, were actually deployed for the purposes of benefiting the, the, the people of British Guyana, which is you know, unacceptable to Washington and London. So Britain sent a gunboat and overthrew him. The Americans supported him. In fact, the Queen signed, signed the order suspending the, the British Guyanese constitution. British Guyana was a part of the sort of British imperial system at that point. 
Um, those are just two examples from the 1950s. There are obviously lots of other cases of Britain supporting U.S. aggression, whether you look at, say, in the 1970s, the, the, the CIA's overthrow of Allende government in, in Chile in 1973, the declassified files show that Britain, British planners, officials strongly supported that. Uh, Nicaragua in the 1980s, Britain, you know, the Thatcher government also strongly supported the U.S. attack against against the Sandinista government in the 19 in the 1980s and and you know and many more examples so you know Britain plays this 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 junior role um, to the US in in, mil in 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 military power in in intelligence relations as well you know MI, MI6 is known to play a very supportive role to the CIA the same applies actually to GCHQ uh, at the UK Signals Intelligence Service, which is very much plugged in to the National Security Agency, the you know the main U US the US Signals Intelligence Agency, and the two cooperate very closely on things like targeting operations for drone strikes. The US has ten so-called RAF bases in the UK, which are actually US Air Force or US intelligence bases. They're called RAF bases just to pull the wool over the public's eyes. They, they, are, they are US bases. Uh, and at a couple of those bases, particularly RAF Croton and uh, RAF Menwith Hill in, in the UK, there's very close intelligence cooperation between, between the US and the UK in all sorts of drone, drone operations we, we know about, other things they're up to we don't know about because these places are top secret. I'm glad you brought up Iran, actually. Um, a lot of talking heads in Britain and the West more generally often wring their hands about the, the rise of radical Islam in the Middle East. And the implication with a lot of their work is that they're a very backward people and you know, they need saving from themselves. But what is rarely, if ever, acknowledged is Britain's consistent support for a wide range of Islamist groups nurturing them, funding them, and supplying them, and then overthrowing secular governments like uh, Mossadegh in Iran. That's essentially what you lay out in your book, Secret Affairs, Britain's Collusion with Radical Islam. Could you describe a little bit more about what Britain's role was in promoting these groups? So I think there is a long history of Britain supporting Islamic extremist groups. The, the root of it really goes back to empire, um, where British elites were often confronted by nationalist forces that threatened their continued control over territories in, in the empire. And what they often resorted to was cultivating relations with other forces who could act as counterweights to those nationalist groups. Uh, in some cases, they were Muslim organizations. In other cases, they were um, uh, other allies who, who they could depend on and, and, and buy the support of in order to play off the opposition, in order to divide the opposition. We saw that particularly in, in the case of India, where uh, Britain supported the Muslim League for decades as a way of trying to shore up support for its continued rule in, in India in the face of increasing um, Hindu nationalism, in, Indian nationalism. Um, so that, that kind of provides the roots for this cooperation and, and support collaboration with Islamic extremist groups over the last few decades. So the, 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 the serious beginning of this was really in Afghanistan in the 1980s, when the UK played a covert role alongside the US, alongside Pakistan and Saudi Arabia in, in bolstering the, the, the Mujahideen forces to fight Soviet occupation. And Britain played a very significant role in training some of those groups, uh, actually in arming them as well, um, sometimes directly in alliance with the US, sometimes in a more uh, independent way from the US, but it was an integral part of that operation to, um, to support these Muslim fundamentalist groups. And, and they were recognized as being Islamic fundamentalist groups who weren't pro-Western. They were recognized that by Whitehall officials. Um, and of course, we, we know that out of that infrastructure of uh, support for, that, for those Mujahideen warriors over a period of decades, when they've been given billions worth of arms and, and training by Western and Arab forces, 
out of that infrastructure developed Al Qaeda and uh, a, a, a kind of a wave of globalization of terrorism. But that didn't stop Britain or the US collaborating with those groups. Um, there are various other episodes since then where, where Britain has been secretly bolstering uh, Islamic extremist forces in, in particular conflicts. And, and, and there's a very particular reason why they've done it, which is to counter nationalist governments, to, to try and overthrow governments that they don't want to see in power. So in, uh, in Syria and, and Libya over the last 10 years, Britain has been an integral part, I mean, to, well, to take Syria, Britain has been an integral part of that covert operation, again, by an alliance of countries, Western and Arab, similar countries, actually, to those who, who supported the Mujahideen in Afghanistan in, 1980s, in the 1980s, been part of that covert operation and over operation, which has funneled millions of dollars, arms, training, uh, into Syrian opposition forces who, who are at least linked to um, jihadist groups, extremist groups. Uh, most of the money has gone in from, from, from Qatar uh, and from Saudi Arabia. Uh, key British allies that Britain has been working with integrally throughout the, the conflict in, in Syria. Similar thing happened in, in, uh, in Libya, where Qatar is known to have poured in hundreds of millions of dollars worth of arms and uh, to the uh, Islamist rebels in Libya to overthrow the Gaddafi regime. They did that with the um, support of the David Cameron government with a direct military role and a covert role um, that the, the, the British government of David Cameron played alongside that operation to bolster those Islamist forces on the ground in Libya and, and contributed again to, to further terrorism in Europe because what happened in, in the wake of the, the overthrow of the Gaddafi regime was that there was chaos and anarchy in Libya. Uh, Islamic State set up numerous camps in the country and it was from those camps that many terrorists were trained um, who then went on to conduct attacks uh, in, in Britain and in, in Europe. Salman Abidi, the Manchester bomber, the guy that blew up 22 people in, in 2017 in Manchester, had been trained in one of those camps in Libya that only existed um, because the Gaddafi regime had been overthrown and, and Libya was a safe haven for, for terrorist training camps. Um, so the, the, these are some of the episodes that, that, that Britain is, uh, has contributed to. There, there's, a, there's a few, other that, few others that are less well known than, than the Syria and, and, uh, and, and, and Libyan episodes. So th this concept that Britain and the US have been fighting a, a war on terror, you know, I think is misplaced because although there, are, there have been some efforts to counter uh, Islamic State, you know, there's been a, a mass bombing campaign since 2015 in, in Iraq and to a lesser extent in Syria to counter Islamic State. Although there have been attempts to, 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 to counter IS terrorists, that has gone alongside um, working in collaboration with forces who are at least allied to, um, to jihadist and extremist groups. And, 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 and this whole period in, 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 in British foreign policy has been completely buried in the media. Uh, I, I mean, it's sim there's simply very few, very few articles, very little analysis of how Britain has systematically been collaborating with these forces, um, both over decades and, and in recent years. Yeah, I mean, this is what you lay out in Secret Affairs, that uh, Britain's role in uh, supporting these groups is really fivefold as you know as a global counterforce to the ideologies of secular nationalism and Soviet communism to as a conservative muscle which uh, you know within countries will undermine secular nationalist governments and bolster pro western regimes uh, three as shock troops to destabilize or, or overthrow governments four as a proxy military fighting force to fight wars and five as political tools to leverage change from these governments. And really the objectives for Britain in that is to influence and control key energy resources, specifically oil, which is always identified by the British as the number one reason. It's the same with the Americans. I mean, there's a famous um, 
There's a famous document from the Roosevelt administration which describes oil as the most stupendous prize in all world history, specifically the Middle Eastern oil. And that's really because our modern economies run around oil. You can't do farming, you can't have transportation, you can't have uh, electricity without oil. It is enormously important. And ultimately, that means that uh, if the revenue from oil has to keep flowing into the coffers of Western banks in the United States or in Europe, that means democracy is simply off the table there. Because anybody who's even reasonably democratic will look at the fact that all of this uh, cash is flowing out of the country and say, actually, the oil of the Middle East should be used to help the people of the Middle East by building schools and hospitals and roads and just generally developing the country. And so I guess that is why uh, Britain and the United States and other Western countries have always seen uh, these far-right religious crazies as a good group to work with because they really don't care about democracy. They only really care about power. And it's an interesting kind of historical what-if to think, you know, 50, 60 years ago, the Western part of Asia was actually a very secular place. Uh, leaders like Mossadegh and Gamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt were really leaders in a new era, and they were threatening to change the entire course of the world. And I think that's really why um, Britain and America have really preferred these religious extremists to these secular nationalists. Yeah, and what you're saying about the importance of, of oil to, to Western planners is very important to, to understand. I mean, anyone reading the British planning record in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s in particular, as, as, I've, as I've done at sort of great length over the years, could not fail but see that the control of Middle Eastern oil was the, was the one overriding priority for, for British planners. And I mean, we kind of have to remember that in the, in the 50s and 60s, the, the oil resources of the Middle East were under the direct control of Western companies. I mean, British and, 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 and US multinational oil companies. And so, you know, they had very particular stakes to, to defend and, 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 and protect in making sure that no governments came to power that would challenge the, the, the Western multinationals control over the, that oil. As the post-war period progressed and countries like the Gulf states took over their, the oil resources from the direct control of the multinationals, it became more imperative for Washington and London to make sure that they, in effect, controlled those Gulf states themselves. And sure enough, that, that has what that that's what's happened the, the 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 key strategy now is to keep those repressive ruling regimes in power in saudi arabia in uh kuwait in qatar in the united arab emirates in bahrain in oman these these are key states to anglo-american power because they sit on top of these vast oil and gas resources um, and in order to keep them in power, what do we do? Well, we sell them arms is, is, is one thing, which has the benefit of being extremely profitable for um, Western arms companies and also provides employment to Ministry of Defense and Foreign Office officials who find lucrative employment in those arms corporations. So it benefits the elite personally as well. But we also train their, their internal security forces to make sure that they can repress their populations. I mean, that, that's the purpose of, of this internal security training that, that is provided to, uh, particularly to, to the Saudis. Britain's had an internal um, security training program in Saudi Arabia since 1964. You know, decades of propping up the House of Saud. Um, and, you know, to ensure that the, the ruling regimes are not threatened by uh, the possibility of, of an uprising uh, to ensure that there is repression. Uh, it, when, when, when you read West, the, you know, the Western media on how Britain is uh, not, support, not necessarily supporting human rights in the Gulf states, it's kind of presented that, well, Britain supports human rights, it's just a bit of a shame that we're propping up those regimes. The, the reality is, there is no concern with human rights. The key is to prop up those regimes to actually repress the population so that there is no human rights to speak of 
in those countries. I mean, that, that's the absolute clear, clear priority. It's explicitly outlined in the, in the, in the historical record. Um, so it, 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 it's, it's very clear what's going on. Uh, and yes, as you were saying, the, 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 is, the Islamic right has traditionally offered a very good counter, a, a very good alternative to the secular nationalist forces who have threatened Anglo-American power throughout the, the post-war world, particularly in the 50s and 60s. There was a kind of a cold war in the Arab world between the secular nationalist forces led by Gamal Abdel Nasser in, 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 in Egypt and the, the Gulf conservative Islamist monarchies led by Saudi Arabia. And in that conflict, Britain very clearly sided with the Islamic rights, with the Islamist monarchies, um, because Nasser and some of the other secular nationalist leaders had this weird idea that the resources of the Middle East should actually benefit Middle Easterners rather than Western multinationals and elite autocrats in, in the Gulf states. So numerous operations were undertaken by Washington and London to destabilize and overthrow those secular nationalist governments. And we, you know, we see a continuation of that concern now um, uh, in, 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 the, in the contemporary world. All right, let's get up to the modern day then. Um, perhaps the worst humanitarian disaster in the world, and especially in the Middle East right now, is Yemen, where uh, over half the country's population is at risk of famine, and more than 20 million people do not have access to enough safe drinking water. At Declassified UK, you recently exposed how Great Britain is actually playing a significant role in the destruction and misery there. Could you tell us what the UK is doing in Yemen? And also specifically, why are there British troops in Yemen right now? Yeah, so we have done a lot of work at Declassified um, on the Yemen war, and much of that's been done by my colleague, our, our, our chief reporter, Phil Miller, who's uncovered a lot, I think, about the, 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 the British role in Yemen, some of it secret. Um, I mean, in a way, we, we can sum it up quite, quite simply. The UK is doing everything to support the, 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 the war in Yemen, apart from actually pulling the trigger. You know, it, it, it's, it's arming the Saudi war machine, which is conducting thousands of airstrikes. I think 20 odd thousand airstrikes have now been conducted since 2015 over Yemen. We have to remember that Yemen was already the Middle East poorest country. Uh, and that was before 20,000 or so airstrikes uh, over the country in the last few years. But Britain's not only been arming the Saudi Air Force, conducting those strikes, it's been facilitating them. It's been providing technical support to the Saudi Air Force to keep those warplanes flying. Um, BAE, Britain's largest arms company, is working under uh, contract with the Ministry of Defense, British Ministry of Defense in Saudi Arabia to maintain those Saudi warplanes. They probably wouldn't be able to fly, certainly not fly in anything like their current form without that British support. Um, the, the UK is also loading bombs onto the aircraft. They're helping the Saudis target um, uh, their, their airstrikes. There's training of Saudi pilots. Um, the British Navy has been training the Saudi Navy to help in, uh, on various techniques and tactics that could be used by the Saudi Navy to enforce the blockade of, of Yemen. So there's a huge, there's a, a huge range of, of ways in which Britain is, is supporting this war. Of course, what, what Britain has done over the last few years is pretend that it's not a part of the so-called Saudi-led coalition. And, and the reason for that is, I, I think, that, that Britain doesn't want to be held complicit in war crimes because the UN and others have accused Saudi Arabia consistently of conducting war crimes in airstrikes uh, on civilian targets in Yemen. Something like a third of all the bombing targets have been schools and hospitals and farms and other civilian targets in Yemen. Britain has been complicit in this. It knows it's complicit in it. Uh, and that's why uh, British officials and ministers have refused to accept that they are part of this Saudi-led coalition. But the reality is this is a British war. Uh, you know, Britain is playing an integral part in, 
in, in that war. Um, and again, ministers and officials have escaped. I mean, they've escaped being accused of complicity in this war by our uh, incredibly disciplined and media, which, which has, has refused to question them and to challenge them on what are very clear and obvious policies of, of support for this terrible conflict. And I, I, I can't avoid the conclusion that the media bears significant responsibility for the bloodshed in Yemen. I mean, along with the, the actual ministers and the officials supporting the, the war machine, the media's failure to adequately report this war has been terrible. I mean, there, there have been a few sporadic reports, you, as, as you will know, Alan, because you're monitoring these things. Uh, there's been some there's been some half decent reports over the years on the reality of, of this war, but they're very few and far between. They certainly haven't they certainly haven't been consistent, and ministers have simply not been challenged or held to account for their role in the war. Absolutely. I mean, the media has got a lot to answer for, that's for sure. I mean, even networks like MSNBC, which is supposed to be the most leftward uh, of the big networks, MSNBC went over a year without even talking about Yemen at all on screen. And this is a terrible, terrible thing that's going on. It's close to genocide. I mean, Oxfam uh, did a report which showed that the Saudi-led coalition has been bombing water, sewage, and medical infrastructure uh, at a rate of around once every 10 days since the conflict started. Uh, Britain is a big role in this as well. 49% of the country's arms exports go to Saudi Arabia. Um, a lot of us perhaps don't know about it because uh, Britain doesn't have those big names like Lockheed Martin or Boeing or General Dynamics or Raytheon. Uh, it's generally because they you know, manufacture quite sophisticated things like avionics, like the brains that go into missiles or, or jets. Um, but yeah, the UK government is uh, helping to prop up a number of human rights abusing governments in the region, plying them with weapons used to repress their populations. Uh, I know, for instance, you at Declassified recently published a report about the UK's collusion with Qatar. Meanwhile, you've also said that Saudi Arabia is uh, the UK's second special relationship. Uh, do you have any comments about uh, these Gulf states? The 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 relationship that Britain has struck up in the last couple of years with Qatar is is particularly extraordinary, I think, because um, Brit Britain is is now developed the, the its first joint air squadron with any country since the Second World War, since the RAF fought with the Polish um, and and the Czech squadrons during the Second World War. Britain has just set up in the last couple of years a joint air squadron with Qatar. I mean, Qatar is a deeply authoritarian state, repressive state, um, which throughout the, two, the, the, the 2010s played the key role in providing arms and um, funding military training to a range of extremist Islamist groups in both Libya and, and Syria. Uh, Qatar is, is, is even reported in the mainstream to have provided something like $400 million to Islamist forces in, in Libya uh, in, in 2011 to overthrow the Gaddafi regime. In, in Syria, Qatar has been reported to have financed hardline Islamist groups uh, as part of the um, opposition forces to, uh, to the Assad regime which has bolstered and, and empowered those extremist groups who, who, are, who, who are either al-Nusra, al the al-Qaeda affiliate, or who are working alongside al-Nusra and other extremist forces. Um, in, in fact, in, in London at the moment, I mean, there are two court cases go, going through the legal system where Qatar, Qatari officials are accused of providing hundreds of millions of dollars to extremist forces in, uh, in Syria. Uh, and while, this, while these court cases have been going on, the RAF has been setting up a joint air squadron with the same state accused of funding terrorism, essentially. That's an extraordinary development, even by exceptionally low British standards of, of backing these authoritarian repressive regimes, which they've been doing for well, actually, centuries. 
certainly decades if we're talking about the post-war world. Um, Saudi Arabia, yes. Well, Britain, if you, if you look at the nature of Britain's relations with Saudi, it's hard to avoid calling it a second special relationship because the, the range of military cooperation, intelligence cooperation, internal security training, apologias, investment relations, you know, the Saudis in, are allow, have been allowed to invest tens of billions of pounds in the British economy, buying up all sorts of uh, prestigious buildings and infrastructure with no questions asked in the media, very few questions. Uh, Qatar has been able to do the same. I think the amount of Qatar's investments in, in the UK is something like 40 billion pounds. Where, where has been the debate about the British economy being opened up to these Gulf regimes and us selling off key parts of our economic infrastructure to, to repressive autocrats? Uh, you know, there's been very little scrutiny of this. And, and, it, and it raises, you know, a lot of questions about how our own political system is, is actually very centralized and undemocratic and untransparent and not really open to, to proper democratic uh, scrutiny. And I know the UK government has also been breaking its own laws by selling arms to Israel, even as they're being directly used against civilian targets in Palestine, no? Yeah, I have to say that this is, uh, this is one of the most... Um, one of the most significant omissions, I think, of the way that the British media has covered recent British foreign policy, uh, the, the utter failure to report the, the true relationship between the UK and Israel. Uh, I mean, over the last few years, Britain has been happily arming Israel. Hundreds of millions of pounds worth of, of arms have flowed to the country. There's been some sporadic reports on that, still not very much. Um, but, you know, there's intelligence cooperation. There's, there's military training. The, the Royal Navy have been training with the uh, Israeli Navy, which has been illegally blockading Gaza. There's, there's a range of collaboration which has been stepped up over the last few years. What happens is that British ministers go through the motions of occasionally condemning Israel for um, continuing to build illegal settlements in the occupied territories. And they say they make representations to, to Israel to to try and stop them doing that. But the reality is that's taking place alongside all this military and intelligence and other cooperation. And it, it's also happening alongside deepening trade relations. I mean, Britain is, you know, has been trying to sign a, an increased trade, um, trade deal with Israel as well. Um, a new defense cooperation agreement between the UK and Israel was signed last year. Um, we don't know this, the, the contents of it because the government refuses to make it public. Um, th these are really serious matters, you know, at a time when Israel is conducting uh, crimes in, in the occupied territories, and at a time when there is no sign whatsoever that the Israeli control over those illegally occupied territories is diminishing. In fact, the opposite is the case. Um, it, it, you know, Israel is, is the, it, the, the Jewish settlements in the occupied territories are certainly facts on the ground that Israel is trying to create to destroy the prospect of a two-state solution. And Ilan Pape, uh, professor, wrote for a piece for Declassified recently on how Britain is contributing to the death of a Palestinian state because this uh, notion that Britain actually supports a two-state solution is, is completely false because the reality of British foreign policy is that they are collaborating with the Israelis at a time when the Israelis have absolutely no intention of allowing a Palestinian state. And the government, the British government, has also refused to recognize Palestine. Uh, over 130 odd countries in the world recognize Palestine. Britain refuses to do it. And Britain has also recently rejected the, the call by the International Criminal Court to uh, conduct an investigation into war crimes in the occupied territories. So right across the board, Britain is defending Israel and, and collaborating with it. And this is not being reported. You know, it, it, it's really not being covered in the, in the British media. So the public is being kept in, in the dark about a key aspect of current British foreign policy. 
Well, we've been talking a lot about the Middle East, but I don't want to give anyone the impression that that's the only region of the world that Britain is uh, acting up in. Um, one of the recent, the biggest stories of uh, the last few weeks has been this new Australia-US-UK alliance, the AUKUS. It seems to be some sort of military partnership aimed at countering the rise of China. Um, what do you make of this? I mean, especially as uh, the UK and Australia continue to sell weapons to China, even at the same time they appear to be tooling up for a new conflict against them. What's happened is that there's been a, there's been a tug of war and a big disagreement in Whitehall over the last few years about what British policy towards China should be. Clearly, there's been a, a faction of the elite which has wanted to trade with China, it sees China primarily as a, as, a, as a trading partner and as a collaborator with British, British and Western companies. And then on the other hand, there's been a, a faction kind of led from the military and intelligence agencies that sees China as a threat and, and, and wants to challenge China and contain China as, as they put it. Um, I, th I think what's going on is that clearly the rise of China is a, is a new thing in international relations. I mean, it, 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 in, in the coming decades, it, it, it threatens to, uh, to challenge the, the global hegemony of the United States. China's already doing that to, to an extent economically. And it's um, the development of the Belt and Road Initiative and the Shanghai Cooperation Agreement, for example, that, that, that China is, is fostering with other companies clearly makes it a, 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 a rising power and, and a more assertive power economically. Um, and, and militarily, China has also expanded its, its, its reach somewhat in the, in the South China Sea uh, in, in recent years. Uh, and it seems to me that what the, the, the UK and the US are doing is they are they're kind of hedging, hedging their bets and they are worried that um, their right to rule the world by force and to control the world is being threatened by a rising and assertive China. I mean, I, I, I think that the recent agreement with Australia is probably more important for the symbolism of it rather than the actual, the detail of it. I mean, the actual nuclear powered submarines that Australia might get. I mean, that, yes, that could contribute to Australian military power but uh, but i think maybe it's mostly it's sending a signal to china that at least some of the western powers are gearing up to um to challenge china and the the issue for for all of us i think both in the west and in asia is to prevent uh elites on both sides just taking this to to extremes, you know, as, as we move forward, because when things like this happen in international relations, they have nasty habits of turning into fighting wars. And we know that the US has planned in, its, in, its, in the military planning documents, even those that have been made public, we know that the US is planning for wars against China. So the, these, this is not a theoretical possibility. This is a very real danger over the decades that saber rattling by the West um, and with the, with the US, with the UK playing the, the role of junior partner to the US by sailing its warships into the Indo-Pacific region. You know, there's a real danger that this could turn into something very serious. Um, so it is, it, this, this AUKUS agreement is definitely something I think that you know, we need to keep an eye out. On. Now, I know that much of your work relies on documents, whether they're leaked or declassified, and um, that you've really raised a great, a great uh, amount of concern about the fate of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. What have you made of Britain's role in suppressing him? Uh, what can we glean about the British state from, this, uh, from this, these actions? Yeah, so we, we declassified, have done a lot of uh, research on on Julian Assange's situation, and particularly on the, the legal case that, um, uh, that, that Julian Assange has been, has been subject to. And my, my colleague, Matt Kennard, has done a, a huge amount of, of research and uh, discovered a lot of things 
that are very concerning about this case from that legal perspective. I mean, certainly um, the, the bottom line here is that Assange is being punished for um, revealing the crimes of states. And that's clearly why he's being pub punished. This nonsense about being held for a bet, skipping bail um, it, it, it is something that's been manufactured by the British government to keep him in jail at the behest of the US. Clearly, Assange is being punished for telling the truth. And that, that, that is of concern to anyone, it's particularly concern to journalists. It should be a concern to any member of the public. What should also be a, very much a concern to any, any member of the British public is how the British government have appeared to have captured the legal process to prosecute someone. Um, and we have to remember that this is, uh, you know, Julian Assange is not a US citizen. He, 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 he's, he's, he's being prosecuted under, he's being prosecuted by the US under US laws outside of the US. It's, it's an incredible Im imperial arrogance for the US to believe that they can punish anyone uh, in, in this way. But particularly someone that's been, you know, forced to be kept in, in, in confinement for years and years. It's utterly unacceptable. What, what we discovered about the, the British case is that the, the, the British judge in initially presiding over the, the legal case in London has numerous conflicts of interest that, that really should have uh, uh, obviated, her, ne negated her ability to, to, to be the judge in, in his case. She is married to a former conservative defense minister who has links to the military and intelligence establishment. She herself actually received financial benefits from organizations linked to the foreign office before she took on this, this legal case. She is the one that kept uh, Assange in jail and, and rejected the findings of the UN working group on arbitrary detention that said Julian Assange was being held in arbitrary detention, something that the UK government rejected. So this, this person, Lady Arbuthnot, who's now actually a High Court judge, she was actually promoted after she presided over the, the Assange case. Uh, it, it's been an absolute scandal. And, it, it, and frankly, it's only been us in the UK who have reported those conflicts of interest between that judge um, and, uh, and, and her correct rightful ability to be able to preside over a case like this. The, the issue has been subject to silence in, in, the, in the media. And, and we're still living with the legacy of her, of her decisions. And I, and I find it hard to believe that the, the, the way in which this case is now being handled legally can seriously be considered to be in, being handled impartially in the way that we would normally expect cases to be, to be handled in the UK legal system. And, uh, and, and this raises the, the, the fundamental point that, you know, it, it, it's, it's authoritarian regimes that capture legal systems in order to promote their political objectives. That's, that's what happens in authoritarian regimes. Well, that, that's what's happened in the UK in the, in the legal case um, over Julian Assange. Yeah, it's especially surprising given that Assange and WikiLeaks actually tried to play the establishment game of respectability, partnering with a ton of the world's most well-known media outlets such as the New York Times, The Guardian in the UK, Der Spiegel in Germany, Francis Le Monde or El País in Spain. And yet when I went to their websites yesterday afternoon to check, none of them uh, had reported on the bombshell news that the CIA had actually planned to murder Assange while he was in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. What worries me about this is not only how much they have renounced any former association with him, but how it appears that big media outlets are trying to draw a very hard and fast line between themselves as real journalists from respectable media outlets and alternative media as bothersome or irresponsible outsiders who, and they're really cheering their suppression. We don't have too much more time, but I did want to ask you about your own website, uh, Declassified UK. It's just recently been reborn. Uh, could you tell us about why you chose to start it in the first place and what your goals are with it? 
Yeah, we started Declassified UK for a simple reason, really, which is we, we thought that it was about time that the UK had a media outlet that told the truth <laughs> about the, the, the Britain's real role in the world, about Britain's foreign policy, uh, and particularly about its military policies and its intelligence policies, the, the role of UK corporations. Uh, I think if you look at the, the British mainstream media coverage of those issues, it basically is appalling. Uh, there's a large number of uh, British policies that simply never reported at all. I mean, there's just silence across a range of areas, whether it's, you know, British re relations with Saudi Arabia or, or with Israel or with con country like Oman, in which there's almost total silence in the British media, even though it's probably the UK's closest ally in the Middle East. Um, or when the media does report um, stories, they, they report them in, in ways which are beneficial to the establishment. Uh, and, you know, many journalists are in effect in, in the pockets of the security establishment. That's where they get their stories from. Many journalists think their role is to reproduce stories from the Ministry of Defence or from the Foreign Office or from the intelligence agencies. You know, a huge number of, uh, of, of articles are, are simply press releases repackaged as news stories. There's, there's a vast amount of um, uh, policies around the world that the British are promoting that simply never see the light of day. And we set ourselves up to, to inform the public what is being done in their name. It's as simple as that. We, we also see our role as challenging the rest of the media because I don't see a scenario in the UK where we can get changes in policies whether, whether, you know, whether they're changes in foreign policies to, to, to promote human rights and democracy, or whether it's changes to the way in which decisions are made in this country so that we genuinely do have a more democratic decision-making system. I can't see that we can get those changes unless the media system in the UK is thoroughly transformed. Because at the moment, we, the, the public is being disinformed, misinformed, even brainwashed by the way in which the media report what this country does. And we, we need to be a part of a, of, of a new movement of people, a progressive movement, I think, which challenges the way that the corporate media work and, and tries to bring about an, 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 a new media which does perform a public service and that, does in, that, is, that is focused around not on making profits, and not on supporting any particular political faction, but is, but is actually focused on informing people, you know, to provide a genuine public service. You know, it's the public service that the, the BBC claims to have, but clearly doesn't. That's what we need. That's what we need media to do. Of course, we're doing it in very constrained circumstances on a very low budget. I mean, I, I, I calculated it the other day, our, our budget, is 1,216 times less than the Guardian Media Group's income. They have an income of 235 million pounds, uh, an absolutely extraordinary amount of money. And, and obviously the, 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 other corporate, the other corporations that are known as newspapers, um, they, they have vast resources, hundreds of, uh, hundreds of writers. We, we have three. You know, we have three journalists and I, I believe that we've, and it sounds like we're blowing our own trumpet, but, <laughs> but I believe we've probably exposed more about Britain's real role in the world over the last two years since we set up than the rest of the media combined. But frankly, it's not difficult because the, the media aren't focused on wanting to reveal what, what British governments do around the world. That's not their role. I, I don't think that's the role of individual journalists. That's, that's not what, they, that's not what they, th they think their role is. They think their role is to, you know, they, they probably tell themselves they're being independent, but they're not, they're not seeking to genuinely challenge or reveal. Um, and and, and that's, what, that's what we're trying to do. And we're doing it independently because we're not beholden to anyone. We're not a corporation. We're not interested in making profits. We just want to inform people what's being done in their name. Yeah, I mean, the great social scientist Mickey Huff often says that it's okay if media reform isn't your number one issue, but it better be at least number two, because if it isn't, then how are you going to get your message out to the masses? So um, I guess my last question to you is, 
Have you faced any problems uh, in setting up your website? Have you been welcomed by the establishment in the UK? Um, well, we've been welcomed by a lot of um, people in the public because, I mean, we've seen our, you know, our follower numbers and our supporter numbers go up exponentially uh, over the last year in particular. I think there is a, there's a real hunger for independent media you know, among, among increasing members of the British public. I think you know, mo most people know uh, that the, the, the media that they read um, are part of the problem, are, are, are biased, that they do have other goals other than simply telling the truth. But when it comes to the establishment, that's a very different story. I mean, yes, we've come up against the, the establishment already. I mean, a couple of times. Uh, we were blacklisted by the Ministry of Defence for a few months. Um, by blacklisted, I mean, you know, in all of our stories, we, we will go to the Ministry of Defence for a comment. You know, uh, after, if, we're, if we're trying to challenge or reveal something, we'll ask the MOD, you know, what's your response to this? For a while, the MOD told us that they weren't going to provide um, any, any comment to us. And we subsequently found out it was because the, the head of the, the media office in the Ministry of Defence had called us a hostile, um, uh, a hostile media organisation and didn't want his, uh, his staff to collaborate with us. That actually was contrary to the um, civil service code. And amazingly, the Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, actually stepped in and ordered an inquiry, which, which went to Parliament. And, and a, a parliamentary report, a, a report was produced by the MOD, which ended up apologizing to Declassified for having blacklisted us. Um, so we, we, we appreciated that. Uh, we appreciated that inquiry by the Defence Secretary. He was upholding the civil service code that, um, that civil servants have to treat Declassified the same as they would any other media organization and give us a quote on articles in the same way that they would give the Daily Telegraph, you know, a quote. But I think what it did, what, what it, what it, did, uh, what it showed for me is that the Ministry of Defence officials are so used to dealing with compliant journalists who simply do their bidding and who simply repackage their press releases as news. When, it, when an organisation comes along that actually starts to, to genuinely challenge and reveal and expose what they're doing, they're simply taken by surprise. They're just not used to, to dealing with serious journalists who are actually challenging what the MOD is doing. And, and I think that's, that's what happened in, in, in this case. Um, so we, we are not expecting um, to be treated in, 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 in any other way than as a bit of a, bit of a hostile agency going forward, I think, to the, to the Ministry of Defence. But, but that's in the nature of these things. I mean, it's, uh, it's an occupational hazard. Of course, if we are revealing things and exposing things, we will be regarded as, uh, as, as a problem. Uh, that's, that's what all good journalists should be doing. You know, it, it, should not be a, um, it should not be a deterrent. It should encourage journalists to do what they're doing because if they're not annoying the establishment, they're not really journalists in, 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 in my book. Yeah, at this time, independent media is more crucial than ever. So everybody watching do consider supporting us at Mint Press and also at Declassified. In fact, it would be great if everybody watching this could actually go to declassifieduk.org, have a look around the website and then uh, bookmark it as well. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you today. Uh, I hope everybody watching this has enjoyed it as much as I have. Thank you very much, Mark Curtis. Thank you very much, Alan.